right, anybody want to pray to open this up? Anybody want to pray to open this up? Okay, Roger, yes, thank you. Go ahead and pray for us, brother. Father God, we just uh, come before you this morning uh, thankful for being here with us and thankful for watching over us through the past several weeks with the storm and everything and the recovery of that. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together and learn more from your word. And we just pray that you would be with uh, Pastor Jason as he uh, brings us the lesson this morning, that he would have the words to speak that would uh, uh, clarify things for us. And we just thank you for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 So this morning we're going to talk about rebellion against God. We're going to talk about sin. All right, one syllable word, three letters, tiny little word that's caused massive amount of problems and issues. I mean, that's, that's such a, uh, an incredible understatement uh, for our world since the first sin uh, was uh, was committed. Um, and so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to talk about why we sin, where did sin come from, how does sin affect us. And the reason being is that it's always good, it's for every Christian, see, the, the normal part of growing in our walk with Jesus is, is knowing our own hearts. All right? We have to know how we operate. We have to be kind of inward focused. We have to know how we operate. We have to know how we think. We have to know why we operate the way that we do. We have to know why we have these desires so that you can fight sin. In fact, the, the, one of the number one ways to think about the Christian life, if, if you were to read the book of Romans, you, you'll notice that Paul, from Romans 5 all the way up to Romans 9, and then skips over to Romans 12, he talks a lot about fighting sin within our lives. He says things like, put sin to death. Put sin to death in your mortal bodies because you are now dead to sin but alive to Christ. Um, one of my favorite preachers to listen to, a guy named John Piper, um, he's famous for saying that sin is a corpse trying to convince you that it's not a corpse. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. You are dead, you are dead to sin, but alive to Jesus. But what, what the enemy does, what Satan does, what the devil does, is the devil tries to come at us and tries to convince us that we are enslaved to sin, but in fact, we are actually enslaved to Christ. Now, sin still indwells within us. We're still battling against sin constantly. If you have a King James Version Bible, the King James Version puts it like this, the old man is fighting the new man within me. Uh, St. Augustine, the famous theologian from the 4th century, he said, I war against myself and I tear myself to pieces. So the life of the Christian is a life embattled against the sin in our own hearts and in our own minds. And the, the, the really uh, dangerous thing about sin is that sin, again, once again, sin is, it, it convinces us that it's normal, right? You know the saying? To err is wrong. <laughs> wrong. To err is not to be human. Sin is not a natural part of the human nature. God did not create you. God did not create Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. He did not create them sinful. God's intention for our human nature is to be without sin, to be apart from sin. That's why when, when you uh, die and go to heaven, and when, and when Jesus ushers in the new heavens and new earth, you receive a glorified body that is not corrupted with sin. You will exist in a new heavens and a new earth that is not at all corrupted with sin, because God seeks to return all of creation back to its pre-sin state, but at an escalated, intensified level. So therefore, to err is not human. Sin is not natural for us. God's original intention for man, for men and women were to be without sin. Um, well, I'll go ahead and skip ahead and say this now. It's like when you go to a funeral and you hear the, the pastor or the officiant, whoever's officiating the funeral, they'll say, death is such a natural part of what? Why? Wrong again. Death is not a natural part of life. Why was Jesus so furious and angry outside the tomb of Lazarus? In fact, if you, if you, read, if you read the story of, the, of, of, the, uh, of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, it's not a resurrection, by the way. It's a resuscitation because Lazarus dies again. Okay, 
When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, it said he stood outside the tomb. And before it says Jesus wept, it says, it, in the, all the English translations do a terrible job translating the Greek. It says that, that he was deeply troubled within himself. Actually, the original Greek, uh, basically, it, it's, supposed to, it's supposed to give you a, a picture. And the picture is this. Jesus standing outside the tomb of Lazarus and going... <clears throat> Furious and angry. Why? Because death is not a natural part of life. Jesus is angry that death took his friend Lazarus. And he's going to do something about it. And so out of that anger, out of that wrath toward death, out of that unnatural effect that death has on life, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And it was a foretaste of what Jesus is going to do when he returns... When Jesus returns, oh man, I'm preaching now. <laughs> when Jesus returns, he won't say, Lazarus, come forth. He'll say, my people, come forth. And the loudest places on the earth will be graveyards. Because those bodies will rise. And our spirits, our souls will meet our bodies and we will be transformed. And, and how fast is that transformation? In a twinkling of an eye. And the thing that we used to say death was a natural part of life, you'll discover it was never a natural part of life. Because you'll live in that glorified body for all eternity. So we're going we're to look at how death entered into the world. We're going to look at how brokenness and sin entered into the world. And then next Sunday, the Lord willing, we're going to look at how God is going to undo what we did. Right? You know, it's like when you walk into your kid's room and you're like, look at this mess. Look at this, you know. Come on, let's clean it up. Right? God's sort of the parent walking into the room and he's going to undo the mess that we have created for ourselves. Okay? So let's 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 start with some opening discussion. Let's have a discussion about this. So what is sin? Can anybody define to me what sin actually is? What is sin? Alright, as we sing this out, what's sin? We turn it to two syllables. Alright. Yes, sir, Roger. I would say it's the um, uh, anything that's against the nature of God. Okay. Alright. Anyone, anybody want to talk Roger's answer? Roger, you win the prize for this morning. There we go, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it, basically, anything, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, but anything, any thought, action, desire, anything that does not measure up to God's character. And can anybody measure up to God's character in this room? Okay, that means what? You're all sinners. All right, congratulations. Here we go. So why do we sin? Why? I mean, so, so Paul in the book of Romans, I think it's Romans 7, he says, the good that I want to do, I don't do. And the bad things I don't want to do, I do. Right? I, I don't, and he's, he's like, why do I do, why do I sin? Why do I do these things? So why do we sin? Do what? See if we can get away with it. All right, see if we can get away with it. Okay, yeah, all right. Have my kinky you too. The honest answer, well, why else? Why, why do you think we sin? Weakness, okay? Yeah? Alright, so intentionally, it's unintentional, it's a weakness, okay? Why else? Yes, sir? Alright, we have a we have an inherited sin nature which we're gonna talk about, okay? What about this answer? Why do we sin? Because we want to. We want to, which goes along with the sin nature, which goes along if I can get away with it, which goes along with the weakness in us, right? We sin because we want to. We want to sin. Um, it, so there's no such thing as arbitrary free will. Even secular philosophers will tell you, no one makes or does an absolute free choice. You choose the thing based on your desire for the thing. In other words, you don't choose something without some kind of desire. So without some kind of premeditated, presumptuous desire for the thing. So when I leave the church uh, property, and I go out here, and I, I come to Scenic Highway, I turn right. Why do I turn right? Because I want to. Why? Because that's the way home. I want to go home. Okay? Because I want to. Why do I, go to why do I go to the grocery store? Because I have to. I want to. My kids need milk. They need cereal. All right? I want, I want to stop hearing that pantry door open and shut. Okay? <laughs> that's why. So why do we sin? Because we want to. Number three, 
How do we sin? How do we sin? Not a trick question. Where do the many different ways we sin? Our mouths, our minds, our actions. Okay? And, and the Bible teaches that every facet of us is tainted and affected by sin. Every facet of our human, of our human nature is affected and tainted by sin, by brokenness. Alright? So let's define what sin actually is. Okay, now Roger's ruined it, ruined it for us. Oh, but we're still going to repeat some of the things that Roger said. Okay, just kidding. So defining sin, what is sin? Well, sin literally means missing the mark. That's what the Hebrew word means. It means missing the mark. It's, it's sort of like you have a target, all right, and you have to hit that bullseye. Well, we miss that bullseye, don't we? Uh, I can't even hit the target. I can't even hit the cardboard. All right, okay. It's like I'm ashamed to admit, admit this, but one time I was at the gun range, and I didn't, and uh, I was sighting in a new rifle I just bought. All right, and if you guys know what sighting in a rifle means, when you're sighting it in at 200 yards, <laughs> I was hitting the other guy's target. <laughs> <laughs> I fired the round, and I heard the guy next to me go, "Whoa, that's a good shot." <laughs> Yeah, so sin is missing the mark. It's, it's like Roger pointed out. It's any failure to conform to the moral law of God in act, attitude, or nature. Any failure to conform to the moral law of God in act, attitude, or nature. In other words, God says this is what you have to reach in order to not sin, and we never reach it. We, it's, it's any failure... To conform to the moral law of God and act attitude or nature. So I already have it on your paper. Okay. There you go. Okay. <clears throat> it's not measuring up, it's missing the mark. Question. Yes, sir. Why does it say moral law and not just law? It could say law. Right. I could put law, but moral law means implies there's a there's action involved. In other words, I must I must not only think rightly, feel rightly, but I must obey and act rightly. So more, the, 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 the word moral there just, just implies an acting out God's law, not just believing God's law. Because a lot of people say, oh yeah, I believe in Ten Commandments. Really? Do you? Yes. Have you broken any of them? Then you don't believe them. You see? People go, oh, I'm a believer in Jesus. Really? Do you, is, is your whole life conformed to Jesus? Well, when's the last time you've been in church? I just, well, my faith's personal. I love my faith in my own. Yeah. That's why I put the word moral there. Because moral implies an action. It implies acting out. Which we, which, when you look at the Ten Commandments, and we all fall short of those. All fall short. I, when I watched my gators lose last night, I fell short of all ten of them on So, <laughs> I see him. A lot watching. I said a lot watching people. <laughs> Good grief. All right? So, it's any failure to conform to the moral law of God. And act at it. All right, but there's other. There's two other words that the Bible uses for the word sin. All right, another another word the Bible uses is the word transgression. You probably read this when you're, or you've noticed this when you're reading the Bible. Okay. Um, in fact, David writes about his transgressions in Psalm 51. So transgress, transgressing or transgression is intentional breaking of God's law. Uh, so like what my sister said a while, a while ago, see if I can get away with it. And we're going to read Genesis 3 here in a minute. And they are transgressing. They are intentionally trying to get away with something. <clears throat> they knowingly, they want, they, they are uh, wantingly, and they are, they are intentionally trying to get away with breaking God's law. They're trying to have their cake and eat it too. All right? And it falls off the rails so quickly. Well, I, we'll get to that in a minute. I want to get to that in a minute. So transgression is breaking God's law. Iniquity. All right, so if, if, if transgression <clears throat> is the actual breaking of God's law, Iniquity is, is the desire. This is, this is that desire, that passion, that wanting. It's the desire to break God's law. It's our sin nature, like Bill pointed out a little ago. It's our nature to do it. It's in our nature to do it. Okay? So we sin. We miss the mark. We intentionally break God's law. Why? Because we are a people of iniquity. We have a desire to do it. Okay? And because we break God's law, because we uh, uh, 
sin against God, we are an offense. And that's tough for a lot of us to, to, to think about or to handle. But we actually offend God. We are an offense to His... In fact, I think in the book of Isaiah, God says, um, I, I abhor your sacrifices, I abhor your righteous acts, they are a stench in my nostrils. Or, or all of man's righteousness are like what? Filthy rags. Filthy rags. And I'm not going to go into detail what the filthy rags actually were. It's absolutely gross. Okay. Um, if it sounds like it, then yes it is. It's what you're thinking. It's what you're thinking. I just won't say it out loud. <clears throat> But that's who we are in God's eyes because of our sin. So something must, something must be done, right? If we can't help ourselves, somebody must help us, right? Okay, well, well you have to wait until next Sunday to hear about that. Okay, let's keep going, okay? So that's defining sin. Sin is missing the mark. It's breaking God's law. It's a desire, and, and, and there's a desire for us to break God's law. It comes from our sin nature. Now, let's look how sin enters in the world. So take your Bibles. Look at, let's look at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And, and y'all... Every time I read Genesis 2 and 3, I'm always, every time, always shocked by how quickly things went off the rails. All right? If, if you'll notice, Genesis 3 is the famous, famous uh, text, or famous chapter of the Bible where sin is introduced into the world. But you'll notice the, like, the, the, the severe quickness by which it enters into the world. It doesn't say, so chapter 2 doesn't end. Um, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed, and they lived happily ever after for many years. It's, 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 it reads like this. Uh, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more, you're like, oh, here comes, I mean, immediately. Right? The seventh day is over. Woman is created. All right? Remember, ladies, you are God's gift to man. We talked about that last Sunday. Okay? All right? Have you been reminding your husbands all week about that? Remember, I'm God's gift to you. Okay, you, you're allowed to do that. No, all right. But immediately the seventh day is over, and then all of a sudden, dadgummit, here comes, here comes trouble. I can't enjoy one day. You ever, have you ever had a day like that? Really, I can't enjoy, I can't have one Monday without something going crazy wrong. All right, or your Friday feels like a Monday. That's terrible, terrible. So let's look at how sin enters the world. Well, first of all, we... We have to know what, what God's law actually is. If we're not gonna, if sin is breaking God's law, then what is God's law? And what has God commanded us to do and to not do? All right. Well, you're going to discover that in the book of Genesis, at the very beginning in chapter two, Adam and Eve had one job to do. Just one. Don't do one thing. Right? Son, don't touch the oven. It's hot. It's like, I, I can lay out all the chocolate chip cookies on the counter I want. Hey, boy, don't touch that oven. Right? Ah! Daddy! I had all these chocolate chip cookies. What, what's wrong with you? You know what I mean? The one thing he was told not to do, he really does. And all of us do that, don't we? You know what I mean? Especially me. I have this, like, rebellious spirit in me. And I, I have this, like, this voice in my brain that goes... Can't tell me what to do. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, right, every redneck's right last words. Watch this, <laughs> right? That that's the, this is yeah. I was always, I'm the middle child, so I'm the reason why rules exist. Okay, and so I was like, I can't, you can't tell me not to do that because I can do it. Okay, but what does God's law actually say? All right, and and, and the reason why I, I want us to I want us to look at this is because chapter two verses five to seventeen repeats itself throughout the Bible. <laughs> and, and this is what I mean. There, there, there's a framework here where God says, look, I've done all this good stuff for you. So obey me. But us, what do we do? We, do, we disobey God. And then he comes along and says, okay, I'm going to save you. Now remember what I've done to you. Obey me. And then what do we do? Disobey. All right? It's a pattern to our scripture. That's why God gave the Ten Commandments. God says, look, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I've saved you. I've given you my grace. Now, therefore, obey me. And then two chapters later, what are the people doing? Building a golden calf. At the foot of the mountain, God's they can visibly see God's presence, lightning, fire, smoke, thunder, trumpets. 
puts the whole nine yards, and what are they doing? They're building an idol? And you're like, what are they, crazy? But that's you. Is it not? We'll leave this church and go home, and we'll, we'll sin just after we get home. After sitting in God's presence and reading his word, don't we do the same thing? When that person cuts you off on the way, on the way back to Solo Vita, don't you cuss out? <laughs> Your laughter proves my point. <laughs> but Genesis chapter 2 is a pattern. It's a pattern. Okay? In fact, look at, look at chapter 2, verse 5. Let's read through this. <clears throat> when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plants of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. So right off the bat, remember that? Remember that remember I told you the book of Genesis is all about anticipation. It's building anticipation. Now notice the word, all the negatives. No bush, no plant, no rain, no man. All right, and so you're going, what's God going to do? Remember, I, remember we talked about that, Genesis 1, and 3, 1, 1 to 3. What's God going to do about this? Well, he's going to fix it all. Look at um, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. There's the grace. I've given you life. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I saved you from your sins. Right? There's the grace. And the Lord God planted a garden in, in Eden, in the east. And there he put the man whom he formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Now, <clears throat> underline those words. I'll read them to you again. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is what? Pleasant. Underline pleasant. Pleasant to the sight. Underline the whole phrase. Pleasant to the sight. And what? Underline that phrase. Because we're going to see it repeated, but in the negative in chapter 3. Because what Adam and Eve do in chapter 3 is the antithesis to what God's law teaches. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden. And the tree of the what? Oh, so how many trees are there in the garden? Two. All right, I asked this question last Sunday last in my sermon. Everybody said one. I'm like, Ooh. two. <laughs> there are two. Verse 10. And a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Bishan, is the one that flowed around the whole land of Habila, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. The Delium and Onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gahan. It is the one that flowed from the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of how many trees? Every tree. Chocolate chip cookies everywhere. All right? You can eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree... Of the knowledge of good and evil. Did he say the tree of life? No. no. They had access to the tree of life. Right? I mean, it's just like, anyway. Do you see the insanity here? <laughs> One tree. Now, you sh you're shaking your heads. I can see somebody shaking your heads. But that's us, guys. We have access to Jesus. The tree of life. The penultimate tree of life. And what do we do? We choose the death of sin over and over and over again, do we not? And that's the problem. That's the problem. Every human heart, every human mind, every human being. You shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely what? Die. Die. All right? So what do we learn here? Well, first of all, we learn that humanity is under divine obligation to obey God's law. Why is that? Why is humanity under divine obligation to obey God's law? You want to take a guess? Say that again. That's right. God created them. Therefore, they are under absolute divine obligation to obey every letter of God's law. Because God's the creator. That means every human being is still under obligation to obey every part of God's law to the fullest. Why? Because he's our creator. And we owe him all allegiance and obedience. But once again, the problem is we can't, right? We can't. Somebody had to obey the law in our place. Somebody had to obey the law in our place. And in return, 
that someone had to give us his righteousness because we have none of our own, right? And who is that someone? Jesus. There it is, Son of Jesus. 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 Jesus obeyed the, obeyed the law perfectly, and as a result, uh, the, the theologians call it the passive and active obedience of Christ is, uh, is clothing us. We are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. We are covered with the righteousness of Christ. Okay? So if humanity is under divine obligation to obey God's law, B, God provides good things for humanity to enjoy. Look at this. I mean, you notice several things here. Why, why verses 10 to 14? Everybody take your Bible. Look at verses 10 to 14. Why put that description there? Why? Other than maybe giving a geographic location of the garden. But, but why all the description of gold and onyx and medallion? And nobody knows what medallion is, by the way. Why put all that there? Because it's a place of beauty. The garden wasn't just some, you know, shack. This was a beautiful, unbelievably gorgeous. How many of you guys have been to the Grand Canyon? When you walk to the edge of the Grand Canyon, how many of you guys just stop breathing? <laughs> I'm like, whoa. I was 12. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Now, I was also a smart aleck. Because my dad talked about how exciting it was to get there. When we got there, I walked up and said, yep, it's a hole. <laughs> and then dad almost picked me up and threw me into the hole. <laughs> But no, seriously, I, I, I couldn't breathe. I was like, oh. And then we took the mule ride down. Oh, yeah. You know, which made me pass out. But unbelievable beauty, right? Incredible. You know what I mean? And so the description here is trying to tell us God created a place of beauty for us. A place of beauty. All right, so what are some other things that God created for, for humanity to enjoy? All types of food. Isn't it interesting that from the very beginning, even before sin, food was a good thing. Alright? And all buffalo wing lovers out there say amen. Amen. <laughs> Steak, yes. Alright? Barbecue, that's right. The, the man's three favorite letters, BBQ. <laughs> Put together, okay? So I can buy this. Do what? North Carolina ball. Yeah, well, we're not going to have that debate right now, all right? <laughs> Let's not sin talking about sin, okay? <laughs> all right? So the, the big, so we have a place, we have, we have a place of beauty. We have all types of food. We all have all types of things to enjoy. And then God gives us each other. We have, we have a man and a woman to enjoy, to have us with, to have, have there in the garden. All these things. And so see, if you flip your page over, God has the right to require whatever he wishes from those he created in his image. So he has a right, even though he created all these good things, he has a right to tell them what to do with those good things and what not to do with those good things. And the only thing he says is cultivate the garden, work it, enjoy it. I mean, man, when you enter into heaven, when you enter into the new heavens and new earth, when Jesus returns, God will say to you, go, enjoy yourselves. Right? And we're going to go, you sure about that? Yeah. <laughs> Didn't work out the first time. No, we're not going to say, we're going to just run and frolic. You know, just have a blast. It's going to be great. All right? But all, just one thing they were not, they were not supposed to do. And you notice all the commands in, here in, in Genesis chapter 2 are in the positive. Procreate. Exercise dominion. Cultivate. There's just one negative, but do not. One thing. I, I, I had someone say to me um, one time, I mentioned, uh, I was teaching on the book of Leviticus, and I mentioned there were over 700 laws in the Old Testament. 700 laws. And they were like, why, are so, why does God want us to obey so many laws? I said, because we couldn't obey the one. Right? We filled up the one thing, and that brought on so much more law. Because that's how bad. I said, that's a, the reason why there's so many laws in the Old Testament, because we are such great sinners. And all those people said, Amen. we're such great sinners. We need so many rules to tell us which way to go to God and how to obey God. Because we have so many ways we don't know how to or can or won't. Okay? So God has the right to require whatever wishes from those created in his image. 
And then D, God's word is to be fully obeyed. God's word is to be fully obeyed. Any questions about any of that before we jump into Genesis 3? Which, I, which Genesis 3... <clears throat> so Genesis 3 is meant to be read like you're looking in a mirror. Okay? I'm going to warn you. Genesis 3 is meant to be read like you're looking in a mirror. Genesis 3... Yeah, the whole Bible is confrontational. So John Calvin, the grandfather of our denomination, he said, you don't read the Bible, the Bible reads you. You ever notice that? You ever like, you read the scripture, and you're like, it's like God is talking to me. And, you, and then you're like, duh. God is interpreting you. You're not interpreting, you're not interpreting scripture. God's interpreting you through his scripture. God's reading you through his word. Uh, Hebrews 4, or Hebrews 6. I don't know, y'all look it up and correct me. But anyway, I think it's Hebrews 4. It says that, that the word of God is sharper than two, any, two, any double-edged sword. And what does it say? It says, piercing down to the very bone and all the way down to the marrow of who you are. And the, 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 the word, the language that, that's described there is surgical language. It's, it's as if a doctor wrote it. That's why I think Luke is the author of the book of Hebrews, but anyway, that's just me. But it's like a doctor wrote it. Like it's like a scalpel. The word of God is like a scalpel. It pulls, it, it, it cuts you open and peels back the layers, it goes all the way down to the marrow. And so when we read Genesis 3, Genesis 3 is doing a surgical work on our hearts. It's doing a diagnostic. It's showing us where we fall, fall short. It shows us how we sin. Why we sin, how we sin, where we sin, whom we sin against, all those things that we need to know in order to avoid sin. Alright, well let's look at God's law broken. Well, we have an enemy. We have an enemy. Um, his name is Satan, which uh, you might know what the, the title Satan means. It's Satan, it means the accuser. That's his main goal, to accuse. Notice it doesn't mean attacker, it doesn't mean prince of evil. His number one job is to accuse you, is to convince you that you're not a child of God. That's your number one, that's his number one job. You're not. God doesn't like you. God can barely stand the stench of you, and He'll use God's word against you. you don't you don't you read Isaiah where it says that you're like a stench in the nostrils of God, right? Did, did, did he do that with Jesus? Remember when he took to Jesus, he used Scripture. He used Scripture. God, when the Word and, and the Book of Psalms, O Son of God, says that He will not let His Holy One be be harmed. He's Satan is the Bible better than you do. And he'll use it against you. Right? Uh, what's funny, Martin Luther, I wouldn't maybe suggest this, maybe it's good, I don't know. But Martin Luther, uh, a parishioner came to Martin Luther and said, uh, Dr. Luther, what do I do when Satan accuses me of sin? You say back to him, thank you very much. And the parishioner goes, what do you mean thank you very much? And Luther says, the Satan is playing into the hands of the gospel. You say, yes, I am a sinner, but my Savior is more righteous than my sin, and his grace has saved me, and I'm in Christ. Thank you, Satan, for reminding me of the goodness of my Savior. You turn it back around. I would suggest doing that. You preach the gospel to the accuser. You say, you are a liar. That's half truth. Yes, I am a sinner, Satan, but my Savior has saved me from my sin, and I am in him, and he is in me. Yeah, to preach the gospel back to the accuser. It's called rebuking. That's what it's called. All right? All right, so the enemy. So what does the enemy do? Now look at chapter 3, verse 1. <clears throat> now, the safe, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, now notice, <clears throat> he doesn't go after God. He doesn't go after God. Who does he go after? The woman. All right. Now we're going to start seeing some reversals of some things. So instead of going after God, what does Satan do? He goes after God's image. He goes after the one created in the image of God. And, and what, what would be really, Satan's thinking, what would be really insulting to God is for me to get those who, who, are, who bear his image to trip up. But he doesn't go to the man first. Why does he not go to the man? Why does he not address the man? Right, well that's, yeah, that's ahead. What was, what was Adam's job? Take care of the garden. Take care of the garden and take care of somebody else. 
take care of his wife. Right? The moment the, ser the serpent started talking, Adam should have jumped onto the head of the serpent and crushed his head and killed him. But he does not, does he? So what, what's happening is here <clears throat> is Satan is trying to go for a role reversal. All right? the, the, the role for the man and the woman, the, the man, all right, is to be the spiritual leader in the house. That's how the Bible, that's how the Bible sets it up. And the man is supposed to protect his wife and his family away from evil, right? So Satan, instead of going after the man, he goes after the woman. Not because she's weaker, but because he's trying to turn the roles around. And we're going to see that in a minute. It's still in effect today. Husbands and wives, when's the last time you had an argument? No, don't say it out loud. I'm just a rhetorical question, okay? <laughs> You know, what time you got, preacher? Um, don't I just that loud? The reason why men and women argue is because they, they, they seek to dominate one another. It's because that's one of the effects of the sin. That's one of the effects of sin in the world. We seek to rule over each other. In other words, the natural holistic um, desire to live within the roles that God created for us was disrupted because Satan went after the woman first. If I go after the woman and reverse what God is trying to do, then I can bring death and evil into the world. So Satan goes after to, to destroy God's image and God's design. That'd be another good deed. God's design. He's, in to, he's, he's there to destroy God's image and God's design. Secondly, he's there to get the man and woman to doubt God's word. Look at verse 3. I mean chapter 3, verse 1. What does Satan say? Uh, chapter 3, verse 1, right there in the middle of the verse. Did God, really say? Did God actually say? Now, once again, what was the instrument through which God created the world? He spoke it. He spoke it, and God said, and God said, and God said. Here, Satan is trying to get them to doubt that instrument, trying to get them to doubt God's word. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? He's trying to get an opening. He's trying to get his foot in the door. And Satan still does that today. Did God really say you shouldn't lie? You know, aren't some lies good, right? Or you heard the phrase, little what lie? White lie. Right. So... So he, he tries to get us to doubt God's word. And thirdly, he tries to get us to deny God's provision. Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? They know that they know that God gave them everything that they needed, a place of beauty, everything uh, provisionally. They even gave, he, God even gave them to each other. And here Satan is trying to upturn all of that, twist all of that. And trying to get them to break God's law. So destroying God's image, doubting God's word, denying God's provision. Satan still, he hasn't changed tactics, y'all. He still does that today. He still does that today. And that's his MO. All right? So that's who our enemy is. It's good to know our enemy. Why is it good to know your enemy? Dumb question. Why is it good to know your enemy? Protect against it. Yeah, to know how to fight him. Right? To know how to do battle with him. And you've got to know the gospel in order to do battle with Satan, do you not? If you do not know God's word, and he knows God's word better than you know God's word, he will take God's word and convince you if you don't know how to do battle with him. Okay? And so you have to know your own heart. You have to, you have to know your own mind. And this is why you have to know your own heart and know your own mind. Look at verses 2 to 3. So something's, I'm going to ask you a question, and we're going to come back in a few minutes to answer it, all right? So, so write this question down, and we're going to have a lot of lively debate over it, okay? Uh, when was the first sin committed? Don't answer it now, just write that question down. When was the first sin committed? When was the first sin committed? Now. Look at verses 2 to 3 of chapter 3. So here's the woman's response. Once again, 
Satan starts talking, the serpent starts talking, Adam is supposed to jump on his head and kill him, but he doesn't do it. Look at the woman's response. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. What's the problem with Eve's response? Anybody see a problem with Eve's response? Do what? How? Touch. Do what? By not identifying the right tree. By not identifying the right tree? No, she has the right tree, right? In the midst of the garden. You should not even prove the tree that's in the midst of the garden. Well, there were two trees. There were two trees. Yeah. That's right. All right. So now we're getting to something. Now we're getting to something. Okay? She's not really into which, she doesn't really understand which tree that Satan's referring to. All right? Okay? That's the kind of problem number one. What's the other problem? There's two other problems here with her response. What? Say it again. Touch. Touch. Did God say don't touch it? Eve, that's her understanding. I can't even touch it. So, if your kid goes, man, dad won't even let us go, over do, go do this thing, and we can't even touch it. What does it sound like? They're, well, they're going to touch it. They're bitter. They're, they're, bitter. they're bitter about it. Okay? So right off the bat, Eve is a functional legalist. She doesn't understand God's grace. Maybe there's bitterness building up in her heart. Because she could go over there and, you know, be like, like, you know, oh, yeah, okay. All right. Free. She didn't sin. God said don't eat it. He didn't say don't touch it. And then what's the third thing? What's the third problem with her response? The, la the last thing she says. Lest you die. Surely. Or one other translation is you might die. What did God say, though? You will die. You will die. So watch this now. She misunderstands, you know, God, which tree. She understands it legally, okay, which means she belittles God's grace, and she belittles God's judgment. So, once again, don't answer now, we'll come back to it. When was the first sin committed? Let's keep going. All right, hold right there, let's keep going, okay? So, <clears throat> notice there's also misplaced desires that leads to sinful actions. Misplaced desires. How do we know that? Look at, look at verse 6. Verse 6 is so rife here, and this is where we are to really see ourselves in a mirror. All right? So Satan convinces them. He says, look, you will not surely die. Is he wrong? Verse 4, is, he, is Satan wrong? You will not surely die? Or is he right-ish? Right-ish. Yeah, yeah he's right-ish, right? Satan knows. Okay? He, he knows. You will not surely die, but he, he's... he's uh, He's, he's feeding into there. He's, he's feeding in her, into her legalistic heart and her belittling of God's punishment. Look at verse 5. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. What in the world is wrong with that? Temptation? Well, hold on. Wait a minute. I thought they were already like God. They're made in His image and likeness. Right? It's like a salesman going, you really want this white car. And you look over and you're like, but I already own a white car. Right? I mean, the salesman, I mean, they're already like God. Well, how much more God-like do they need to be? You see the desire? You see the, you know what I mean? Because they're already, he knows they're already feeling it, which means, verse 6, so when the, so when the woman saw that the tree was what? Good. Look at that, good. All right, look at A there on your paper. Now, wait a minute. That word was used in verse in chapter 2, was it not? To describe God's provision. So, in other words, what happened was this. The misplaced desire is, God said, this is good. But now, they're playing the role of God. And they're saying, no, 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 I'll determine what's good for me. That is good. It's like looking at God and going, no, thank you. I'll take this. That's what, it, that's what we're having here. All right? Now, I'll ask you again. When was the first sin committed? Let's keep going. It keeps, it keeps going further. Look at verse 6. Um, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a what? Delight. Wait a minute. I thought God was supposed to be their delight. Their joy. 
their love, their everything. But she saw this other thing as a delight. You can actually take wait, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, six words <clears throat> and use this to combat sin in your life, to, to, to grow your Christian walk. You say, all right, what is the ultimate good? Do I want the sin or do I want God? No, I want the good God. What's a delight to my eyes? This sin, and FYI, sin can never live up to the promises that it claims to make to your heart. Did you know that? Never. So what's delight? This thing or God? What do I desire more? This thing or God? What do I want to take hold of? This thing or God? What do I want to feast on? This thing or God? And then what do I want to give to others? This thing or God? That's basically your diagnostic right there. And the answer to all these is Jesus. Jesus is good. Jesus is a delight. Jesus is the one to be desired. Jesus is the one I want to take hold of. Jesus is the one I feast on. When you hear the word ate or feast, you think of communion, do you not? I feed on him. All right? I want to feast on him, and then I want to give Jesus to others. So, but, but what do we read verse 6? So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was the delight of the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she, uh-oh, fellas, and she also gave Tom some to her what? <laughs> Who was with her? Like most men, he stood there like a bump on the log, while this evil car salesman was trying to sell his wife in a car they shouldn't buy. Now, all kidding aside, man. Okay, so Fox. Mm. Try to be gentle here, okay? Too many churches. I mean, let me rephrase that. Okay, too many churches are going down the hill. Are going down the hill. Oh, okay, let me, let them, they're not going down. All right, let me rephrase. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to say as tactful as humanly possible. I'm trying to get on to men without being offensive. All right? We need more male leadership in the church. I'll just leave it at that. We need more male leadership in the church. Amen. When I, when, I, when I was a little kid, and I asked my dad, I was like 10 or 11 years old, I said, Dad, what does it mean to be a man? And Dad said, worship God with all that you have. Love your family with all that you can give. Pay your bills and work hard, son. And we have so many men in our society who are walking away from those three things. And let me tell you something, all right, ladies? I'm not trying to insult you guys. You guys are doing... Look, you guys are all Deborah. Remember Deborah in the book of Judges? There's no men worthy to lead Israel. So Deborah had to step up. Deborah knew that that wasn't her role. She knew that that wasn't her God-given role to lead that nation. But because there were so many gutless men in Israel, she had to step up and lead. And ladies, you've been, you've been doing an amazing job in leading the church. But men, you got to step up and get involved. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Well, I spent 12 years in full-time youth ministry and children's ministry. I can tell you, almost every single time, when mom was the only one going to church, guess what the kids didn't want to do? They didn't want to go. If the dad was involved in church, guess what the kids did do? They went to church. That's just a God-given, innate thing. Right? When Dad says, let's be involved in church, you got out of bed and went to church. We need more godly men involved in the life of the... Okay, so over. Here we go. Y'all got the point, right? Okay. So, so she gave some to her husband, and he ate, and he didn't say a word. All right, the results and consequences. Here we go. I don't need to get fired up this early. I can get fired up this early. <laughs> All right, the results and consequences. Here we go. Look at verse 7. First of all, shame and guilt. Again, diagnostic. When you sin and you're convicted of that sin, what's the first thing you feel? Shame and guilt. I'm guilty. I feel ashamed of what I did. I broke God's law. Right? Look at verse 7. So, then the eyes of both were open, and, that they, and, that, and they knew that they were what? In the south, we say naked. Naked. Alright? 
And they sewed big leaves together and made themselves one cloth, and they hid from God. So shame and guilt enters into the human heart. Now, y'all, this is breaking God's heart. Once again, this is not a natural, to air is not human. God does not want us to feel shame. Isn't that wonderful? Now look at me, look at me. It is good news that God does not want you to feel the shame and guilt of your sin. Isn't that great? That God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to take away your shame and guilt over your sin. That's good news, all right? So shame and guilt, number two, hiding and covering. Verse 8, what do they do? They cover themselves with one cloth. So when they heard the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife did what? Yeah. Hid themselves. We all cover up our sin, don't we? Yeah. Right? I mean, when I, when I was a teenager, I got real good at backtracking. Cover my tracks. Well, my parents always found out. How do they do that? Actually, as a parent now, I've discovered how to do that. <laughs> but as sinners... We hide and we cover. We try to cover our own sin. We try to hide from God. And, and we are so good at convincing ourselves that we're not really as bad as all that. I'm not really that bad a person. Right? Hiding and covering. Number three, denying responsibility. Denying responsibility. Look at verses 10 to 13. So God, now notice what God does now. Look at verse 9. Verse 9, but the Lord God called to the who? Amen. Now notice God's reversing it back. Satan calls on the woman. But God knows that the man is spiritually responsible for his wife. God comes after who? Amen. Hey, men, guess what? In the judgment, God's going to call on you first. It's the framework of what God does, okay? Hey, fellas. Right. But God called to the man and said to them, Where are you? Did God not know where they were? I mean, come on. Omniscient, omnipotent, right? God knew where they were. What is God doing? What, when, what is God doing by saying, Where are you? What, why, why is he asking that question? If he knows where they are, why is he asking the question? He wants to hear it from Adam. Yes. He wants confession. Yes. Say it again. He wants confession. He's looking for confession. It's like when you. When you say to your kids, all right, this is your chance to fess up. If you're still denying it, the hammer's going to fall, right? And what does Adam do? Does Adam go, you're right, God, I'm split, I'm sorry, I sinned, my wife, I love my wife in sin, we both sinned, we've broken your law, we're equally guilty in your eyes. Is that what Adam does? No. No! He blame shifts, right? That daggone blame shifter, which we all do. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Now that's odd, because he was never fearful of God before. This is not a reverent fear, like, I'm, I fear the Lord. This is, I needed to run from you. Again, God's heart being broken. Adam, you never had to run from me before. What'd you do? Who told you that you were naked? Which Adam never answers the question, if you notice. Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Then the man said, what? Woman, 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 There'll be many people standing before the great white throne of judgment saying the exact same thing to God on the way down to hell. You did this, God! We needed more godly men in the garden, too. Yeah, we need more godly men. We need more godly men in the garden, too. Yes, right. Smack him around a little bit, all right? But she, but she blames who? Who does she blame? The devil made him do it. Okay? So, broke, so they deny responsibility, and then, their, then relationships are broken. Look at verse 16. Broken relationships, all right? Verse 16, he says to the woman, Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. All right, now, this, the Hebrew here is so weird, but it basically means this. Your desire will be against your husband. You will be working against him for the rest of your life. 
That's why we have arguments as married couples. Right? But he shall rule over you. And But the word rule here in the original Hebrew is a violent word. He'll seek to squash your spirit, squash your heart. He'll seek to... In other words, there's a constant tangling, a constant war between the man and the woman. Before, they both perfectly knew their roles to each other and to God. Before, they perfectly obeyed and worshipped the Lord. They were, they were perfect they were in perfect harmony. But now, it's going to be a war of the sexes. All right? Also, a broken relationship. Look at verses 17 to 19. 17 to 19. Broken relationship with creation. He says, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, which I jokingly repeat to my wife sometimes. Anyway. <laughs> And I've eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall, not, you shall not eat of it, curse of the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall bring, bring forth for you. In other words, creation will be working against you as opposed to... Remember God says, exercise dominion? Well, now they can't. This is why lions run after you to eat you. <laughs> you ever watch those nature shows? And then they're, they're, and nature shows a flummox of, of why a great white shark would, would attack a human being. It's not their nature. And I'm like, they have 19,000 rows of teeth. God created them to be a killing machine. Are you kidding me? Of course it's natural. Right? Oh, it's perfectly safe to, to, to swim with killer whales. Why are they called killer whales then? It's <laughs> call them friendly whales. Just be cautious. You know, I don't understand that. It's, it's crazy. You know, because we humans are absolute idiots. All right? It's a broken relationship between us and creation because of sin. And then fourth, pain, suffering, and death. We don't have time to read this, but women, this is why you have pain here in childbearing. All right? And this is why we have pain, suffering, and death with creation in this world. It's why we war against each other. And indeed, but there's a promise. Punishment and a promise. There's a promise. Now, isn't, isn't it any wonder that when God showed up and found Adam and Eve hiding, that God didn't say, you know what, I don't want to hear any of Listen, God would have been, God would have been within, absolutely within his rights for him to say, I don't want to hear it, I'm destroying you right now, starting over. Right? But he doesn't. Instead, he wants to put on, remember Genesis 1, verses 1 to 2. The reader... The, the earth was, was without form and void, and darkness hovered over the deep. And you're like, what is God going to do? Well, the same thing at the end of Genesis 3. You read this, and you go, how is God going to fix this? Well, God gives us a foretaste of how he's going to fix it. Well, notice the curse on the serpent. Hang in there for just, give me two more minutes, y'all. Notice the curse, curse on, the, on the serpent. He says, because you have done this, curse are you above all livestock. And above all beasts of the field, on your belly you shall go, and thus you shall eat all that is of your life. Verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. Singular, those are singular words. He shall, he shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. You're probably already guessing this is about Jesus. If you're guessing that, you would be right. On the cross and the resurrection, this is when Jesus put his heel onto the head of Satan. At the cross is where Satan bit the heel of our Savior. You know that if a snake bites you on the heel, it's not a death blow, right? But if you crush the head of a serpent with your heel, it is a death blow, correct? So the promise is that someone is going to come and destroy the works of the devil and undo what you have done. And he gives them a taste of what that might be. A taste of what that might be. Look, let's get down to verse 20. Let's look at this. Chapter 3, verse 20. The man called his wife's name what? Eve. All right? Before she was just, hey, woman. <laughs> now she's Eve. Anybody want to know, anybody know what the word Eve means? It's right there in the text. It means what? Mother of the living. Mother of all the living. In other words, God says, look, because you did this, death is entered into the world. Things will die now. But Adam believed God's promise to bring life out of death and the demonstration of Adam's faith and Eve's faith is in the name of his wife. From her will come life and from her came life and his name was what? Jesus. 
This is why when you, when you look at the genealogies of Matthew and Luke that, 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 that unpack the, the lineage of Jesus, Eve is always there. Why? Because Jesus came out of the mother of the living. Life came out of Eve. But not only that, look at verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife what? <coughs> Why did he do this? He, they already sowed fig leaves to cover their sin. Why did God feel like he had to double down? Was it cold that day? Blood had to be shed. The what? Blood had to be shed. Blood, a life had to be taken. Blood had to be shed in order for their sins to be properly covered. And it's by implication, Bruce, that God is saying, you cannot cover your own sin. Your attempt to cover your own sin will not do. God says, I must cover your sin. And I have to take a life and shed blood to do it. Which means what? Who? Jesus, right? Jesus gave his life and shed his blood so that our sins may be not just covered. <clears throat> the word atonement means what? Taken away. <clears throat> Taken away. God says, I think it's Psalm 121. No. Psalm 131. He says, I remember your sins no more. How can God do that? He's omniscient. He knows everything and forgets nothing. How does God thank you? Because of Jesus. He wipes our slates clean and says, I have atoned for your sins. I remember them no more. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? That's the grace we have in Jesus. That's the, that's the life we have in Jesus. That's the salvation we have in Jesus. Um, all because he made a promise to do it. God's always faithful to his promises. All right, so any questions more fast? I know we'll keep running over. I've got one going over. Yes, sir. You said earlier about death not being a natural part of life, but then you were talking about God's telling us to change something in death. Yeah. To me, I mean, I'm sure I'm thinking of it. First part out of it. Um, seems like he's making it a natural part of life. Yeah. Right. So, think about it, it's an unnatural natural part. Right? In other words, it's, I call it it's an alien condition to humanity. Death is an alien condition to humanity. But it's a it's a consequence. The alien condition to humanity is a consequence as a result of our century. Right? So. Yes, ma'am. Um, two, three. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right from the end of the sermon. Yes. He said that Jesus found the tree of death. Right. So that we. I have the tree of life. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All that comes together, right? Yeah. I agree. So. All right. Let me pray real quick. And then you guys get out of here. Okay? <laughs> Let's pray. God, thank you so much for being so good and gracious toward us. Thank you so much for your love. Thank you for showing us Genesis 3, confronting us with our sin. And at the same time, confronting us with our Savior and the grace and forgiveness we have in Him. Father, may we leave this place rejoicing, ready to walk in obedience unto you. And all these things ask your name. Amen. Amen.